Welcome everyone to Writing as a Nurse, Annotated Bibliographies and Synthesis. This is one of a whole series of webinars that we have under the heading Writing as a Nurse. These are webinars that delve into specific topics that come up when you are working as a graduate nursing student and doing your coursework, designing research, designing clinical interventions and quality improvement projects and other things like this. Today we're going to focus on annotated bibliographies and how to synthesize the information that you find in these articles that you read. A little bit about the Writing Center. If you've come to us before for any of these, you know the drill. We offer a whole series of different support options. We are available through webinars such as this, through one-on-one -on -one consultations in real time via phone and Zoom, and most students come to us through asynchronous appointments where you reserve a slot by the time it comes around, you upload a draft of your paper with any special requests or areas so that you'd like feedback identified, and then we send you our feedback via email in 24 hours. We have a whole host of related resources, including course paper templates, sample papers, blog posts, and more on the Online Writing Center page. And we also have a lot more webinars coming up this term. Every time we offer a webinar, we record it and make it available on the Writing Center website. So if you were to come to this webinar and have to go halfway through, don't worry, you can always watch the half on our website. We also post them to our YouTube channel, but that can take a little bit longer to post just because of their processing times. We have a number of webinars coming up of general interest and some of specific interest to nursing students. We have our live edit doctoral projects webinar coming up on Thursday at seven o'clock. That is looking specifically at DNP, a doctor of nursing practice projects. We have a writing as a nurse evidence-based practice webinar coming up the week after that on Tuesday. And the Tuesday after that, another one talking about integrating theoretical frameworks. And then two weeks after that, writing as a nurse, the methodology paper. Now, this is a small sampling of the webinars that we have in this series. You can see that there's a great number here where I've highlighted the course tie-ins for you. So if you're in nursing 612, hopefully you watched our Pico Pico questions webinar already. If you are in 647, we have a webinar on medication errors, and this set is growing every semester. Every semester we look at the webinars that people had the most questions about or requests for resources and add some of those. So we are expanding this series and all the new ones that you saw on the calendar here, these have never been offered before, but they will be joining their fellows on this growing list. All right, we have an APA course paper template that I mentioned earlier. Here's a link to do that. We also have a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is especially handy if you want to just watch a video on a break and you have your phone and you don't want to log into the ACU websites and all that. You can just find us on YouTube, search for Abilene Christian University Writing Center and we'll come right up. All right, we have uh, two real focuses here, and I'm sorry that the heading is incorrect. Give me just a moment. Mm. There we go. There's the correct slide. So we're going to understand annotated bibliographies as a general genre of writing, and then we're going to look at the specific expectations for the Nursing 612 locating and synthesizing the evidence assignment. This is for week two, so if you're watching this now, this is the assignment that's due at the end of this current uh, term week. Okay, so let's talk about annotated biographies. So what is an annotated biography? Well, it's a genre of writing that's designed to present the most relevant details from a curated list of sources related to a topic or problem. So by definition, that's designed to be very concise. It's highly selective in what is or isn't included. It's not at all intended to be exhaustive. And there is limited comparison between articles. When you are doing a lot of comparison between articles, that's a literature review. Then you'll get to those in time. But a annotated bibliography is kind of a quick guide. You go source by source, you list the different uh, 
studies using their reference information, and then you provide some sort of summary about them. And depending on the exact format and the assignment, you'll either be connecting this to a larger topic in a big synthesis section at the end, or as is the case here, doing so with a short paragraph at the end of each annotation. So what do you do? Well, we've got that statement of whatever the unifying purpose or theme is in an annotated bibliography. This is usually a short introductory paragraph. Sometimes it's just a sentence or two. Annotations, so those consist of the reference information. Uh, a lot of instructors will refer to it as a citation. It is all the information in the same format that you would have in your references section in APA style, just one at a time for each article that you're discussing. And then after that, you give the summary of the most pertinent details for the purpose or theme that you're exploring. And then in this particular assignment that we're looking at today, you would have your connection to the big picture, the connection to that purpose taking place after that. An example would be if we were doing a study of, say, um, antiviral agents in, let us say, a urban health clinic in Houston. And we're talking, looking at patients with a particular condition and administering an antiviral there. And so presumably that is something that you are looking at a really specific virus. So probably your purpose would be treatment of this virus and perhaps treatment of this virus in a particular community. And there might be some side effects to this drug that, or to the different treatments that lead some people to not want to use them as much as others. So you would summarize the article about that particular thing and then apply it to your specific context and then move on and do another annotation. For example, if we're looking at anti-bullying best practice at the high school level, we might go ahead and sort our annotations and by type, oh, we got our meta study number one, so give that a heading and then the reference, the, the summary, and then the critical analysis. And then, oh, moving on to meta study number two, so give it that a heading, give the reference for it, the summary of the most pertinent details related to anti-bullying practices at the high school level, and then apply that back and rinse, wash, and repeat. Now, in the particular assignment we're looking at today, again, that analysis and synthesis goes at, at the end of each annotation rather than in one big section at the end. That's fine. There are a few variations on how to do annotated bibliographies. You just want to make sure that you are doing the one that your instructor is advising you to do for this assignment. So let's talk about that reference or citation information. So if we were doing that example that source that I was talking about, all right, well, here's our reference information. If your instructor asks that you include a permalink, then you would be pasting that below. APA style does not ask for a permalink. In this case, the preferred thing is the DOI, which you see is there. The permalink is a way to get at this article, to access this article, to be able to read and download it through the ACU library system. So this permalink would not work for someone who doesn't have an ACU account, but in this case, it's a way of our knowing that you went and you found this using the ACU library catalog. So, and it's also very convenient because if you need to access this article again, you just click on it and then you log in and you can download it. All right, so how to find that? Well, let's go ahead and uh, actually, I'm going to show you how to do this in my web browser. So give me a moment to get that share set up. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've opened up the ACU library a website here. So I've opened up the ACU library here and I'm going to do a search here. And let us say that we are looking at treating, um, let's go ahead and say, hmm, let's not do antivirals, let's do varicella. All right, 
So hopefully everyone's been vaccinated against this, but uh, as you know, working as a nurse, a lot of public health things involve finding, oh, something has slipped through the gap. And that might be because the patient is immunocompromised. It could be that they didn't get a vaccination on schedule, many different things. But let's say that this first um, article here was one that we wanted to use. All right, so if I go to the site button here and scroll down to APA, we have a version of the citation here that is formatted in APA style. And you want to always check th these to make sure that they are correctly formatted because sometimes uh, these are done by algorithms and not correct, but this looks good. So I could just copy and paste this in and I'd have it for my annotation. Great. Uh, if you're wondering why it has the two titles, this is a common way of presenting when you have a foreign language title. In this case, there's a Turkish title. I won't try and uh, trans. Uh, I won't try and say that out loud. And we have the English title, and when you are doing that, uh, you just want to make sure you get the order correct. So I'm actually getting out my APA manual here, and I'm checking on page 318, where you have an example of a article in translation. And uh, I realize that that's uh, actually just referring to the article itself. I want to be looking at a journal title in translation. So let me uh, check that again. And I am glad that I checked that because there is one small but important modification that we want to make here. So if you were uh, uh, citing this a thing from a journal that has its title in another language. What we should actually be doing is presenting the title, the uh, translation in square brackets afterwards. So we'd have the original Turkish title here, and then following that in square brackets, we would have the translation, uh, oh, Journal of Pediatric Infection. Gotcha. So just something that comes up sometimes. Uh, let's say that we were looking at uh, no, oh, this article here is actually doing some work on facial nerve palsy. All right, so if we check this one here, we scroll on down to APA, and we see, all right, uh, that's looking good. It does not have a DOI, so we should check to see if it has one. How you do that? Well, a great way to do that is just search for the article name and DOI and see if we get something here. Not every journal will have a DOI. And it appears that uh, this one does not, but let me go ahead and just check the article itself here. Doesn't look like it. I'll do a search for DOI. Nope. Okay. Not every journal does, as, but you just want to do your due diligence. So you can tell your professor, nope, there's no DOI. All right, so what about those permalinks? Well, as it happens, if we are looking at one of these and we have some options, we can save that to our folder, great. We have the site tool, we have search within, but we get more options if we click through, if we open up the article entry, not the article itself, but the article entry. And you'll see that we have this button here, permalink here. And that will give you this link that you can copy and paste that will take you to the ACU library catalog, log you in, and then get you to the article itself here. So if you're looking for the permalink because you're required to do it for your annotated bibliography, that's where to go find it. Generally, you should only include the permalink if your instructor asks for it. It's going to depend based on the assignment. And as you go through the program, and actually as you go through any of our programs, you'll find that some of the different 
annotated bibliography assignments will have slightly different requirements, which is fine. All right, let's go ahead and go back to our slides here. So here's an example, as many if you want to review this. So we open it up, go to site, we get that link. If we click through, we get the permalink button. And so let's talk about that particular assignment. So this is, this is looking at the locating and synthesizing the evidence assignment. Let's check those instructions. The purpose of this assignment is to provide practice and experience with conducting an advanced literature search for your chosen topic, as specified in your revised PICO question. So make sure that you're using whatever you developed after getting feedback on it. You will begin this assignment by revising your introduction, PICO, and search terms based on those faculty recommendations. You will likely discover a large body of evidence. It will be important to evaluate and critique the literature to determine which to include. Ah, great. Let's go ahead and look at that a little bit. So if we are looking at our search results here, and back up one step, we have a lot of results. Uh, in fact, we have 165,000. All right, so let's narrow that down. First, I'm gonna switch to full text because it doesn't really help me right now for this week's assignment if there are more things that I can't get at. I'm also going to set this so I'm only looking at literature from the last three years. Now, if you're wondering why three years, well, a commonly accepted definition of recent research is from the last five years. But if this is things, things that you might be reusing for your doctoral project, you know, it's going to take you a little bit to get through the coursework and to be ready to present that. So by using a more narrow thing, I've set it to last two years to check here, uh, I find I still have 5,000 results. That is probably more than enough for this annotated bibliography. Keeping in mind, I'm not trying to give all the research here, just some of the research that is related to this. And you know what? I, I want to be more specific. It's uncommon for us to have varicella being an issue with adults because of vaccination, at least in this country. So let's make this more specific. I'm going to go ahead and add pediatrics here. And I'm going to use the American English spelling there. All right, so I'm doing my search here. And we find we still have 1700. That's great. Now you'll see that some of this is looking at things in other countries. The first result is in Switzerland. The second is in Hungary. The third one is in Jordan. And the next one is in Italy. Now, I would love to go visit all those countries, but perhaps you are looking for something that is more directly relevant to your context. And if that context is here in the United States, you might want to go ahead and add something like United States to your search terms. And this should narrow down our results a little bit. All right, 717. So that's less than half. And it hasn't uh, taken everything out. In fact, we still see some of those first things at the top, but we've narrowed it down a little bit. Now you have some other options here, like filter by geography. And this requires that the source had been tagged, but you know we only need so many entries here. So let's see what happens if we check that one, see if we still end up with the good number to work with. Another common thing is if you are being restricted to peer reviewed journal articles. All right, well, we can select academic journal articles here and uh, oh, scholarly peer reviewed journals up here. Great. There are, by the way, academic journals that are not peer reviewed. The Harvard Business Journal being a great example of that. It's very well read, but the articles do not go through a peer review process. So if you're required to have peer review, make sure you check that box there. All right, this has brought us down to 19, which is hugely more manageable here. All right, so there are a couple of things we could do here, but uh, you know we've narrowed this down. This is a whole lot less stuff to read through. All right, let's go back to that assignment now. All right, so we've 
gotten our way through the first two paragraphs here. All right, next you will synthesize your articles into a succinct evidence table or matrix. Since there is a vast amount of data available, finding a method to keep track of all of this is very important. Okay, now a literature review matrix, this is actually something that we have available through the Writing Center, but essentially what it is, is a table or spreadsheet that helps you keep track of everything. And then ultimately, you're going to use that to create an annotated bibliography. Now the matrix will help you uh, sort things because you'll be able to classify them and say, okay, well, this is a quantitative study. This is a qualitative one. And then, all right, I've already got two quantitative ones. Let me get two qualitative ones and let me get two mixed, one, mixed uh, methods ones perhaps. Or maybe you'll have three, three, and two to get that minimum of eight. I, so what is the purpose of the lit review? Well, you get to focus on extracting key details like what type of study it was, what the methodology was used, what the population was, and not worry about how you're forming those into sentences. It lets you then go and say, okay, well, here's how I'm going to sort it for the annotated bibliography because I can see from that they're appearing in this format here. All right. so. Looking at the last item here, okay, once you feel you have sufficient data, and this is once you put enough entries into your evidence table or your literature review matrix, uh, it's called a literature review matrix because that's usually when it becomes really, really important. You can use it for an annotated bibliography too. Once you have put enough entries in there, you've, you start looking at, okay, what are the trends here? What are the big picture things that I can look at? If you have five studies that are all saying the same thing, you probably don't need to report on all of them in your annotated bibliography. All right, so let's talk about what you will be doing for your write-up versus that preparation that we were talking about earlier. So the assignment is to do the literature search related to your revised PICO question. So you'll be listing your PICO question in the introduction and then you will be giving your annotated bibliography where you have eight to 10 annotations where you provide the reference information, the permalink, you can see it's required here, your summary of the article, which should be 200 to 250 words. Uh, 250 words is approximately one double spaced page when you're using our APA course paper template. So really, if you have the annotation and then your summary, it's going to be about a page's worth all put together. If you have a page and a half, that's kind of too long. If you have half a page, that's definitely too short, but around a page for everything put together. Great. So your annotation should include the summary of the article in your own words. And the key to doing this and the key to being able to manage writing it this whole article summary in just about a page is to make sure that you're only including the most relevant things for your purpose, which is the things that relate the most closely to the PICO question. Here's an example. So one of the more famous longitudinal medical studies is the, um, excuse me. I'm sorry, one of the most famous longitudinal medical studies that's still going on is the Framingham Heart Study. And this is named after the place where the initial medical center was centered in Framingham, Massachusetts. I was growing up in Massachusetts when this study was started, and it's rather unique in how well they have followed people and to what level of detail they've tracked on it. Now, they were specifically looking at the heart, but they figured they should gather a lot of information that may or may not prove out to be relevant. So they track things like people smoking, who their friends were, uh, they would keep track of the information on their friends so they could tell, oh, this person moved and they moved to a place where they're closer to their friends. They moved farther away. These friends moved close. They tracked all this stuff here. Now, all that data is in the Framingham Heart Study, a data set, but if you're just uh, focusing in on, say, the smoking part, 
there's lots that's probably not relevant. And so you would leave it out. And so the litmus test is, well, is this relevant to the topic as defined in your revised PICO question? All right, so after you've done that summary, that's a curated selective summary, you want to add a synthesis, which is where you, you apply that some of that information to your PICO question. So how does this contribute to your understanding of what you're trying to do, or what does it suggest that you should do? And this is going to take approximately a half page. Could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more, approximately a half page. That's 100 to 150 words. All right. And if you look at the rubric here, you see that it is basically recapitulating those same steps and saying, OK, these are all required. Do not leave out that that permalink, because if you do, that's worth, if you left out all the permalinks, that would be losing one eighth, 12.5% of all the points. That's taking you from an A down to a B, in, include the permalinks. All right, well, let's look at some of this in practice. I'm going to go back to the results list here. And if you just joined us and you would like to suggest a uh, topic to use for this, I'm certainly open to this. Uh, it is really helpful to look at results of things that people are actually interested in here. So let's say that we were talking about chemotherapy and my PICO question was, okay, well, what's the uh, best nausea reduction? All right, I'm just gonna start with chemotherapy, nausea reduction here, and we'll see what we end up with. Now, one of the handy things, but what we should make sure to be aware of, is that when you do a new search here, it will retain the same limits that you had before. So this is including the full text, must be scholarly peer reviewed, in this case from just the last year and a half. And we see that uh, we have a fair number of results here. We've got 4,000, so that's plenty to pick from here. And if I was looking at this to see if I was interested in this, the first thing I want to do is to look at the title. Okay, prognostic role of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in recurrent ovarian cancer patients, results of an individual participant data meta-analysis. Okay, that looks good so far. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click through there and uh, we'll see what we have here. Uh, they have, in most cases, you will find the whole abstract in the database. So you don't have to go look at the article itself. And we can look through and say, okay, uh, they were looking at uh, a three-phase trial in uh, conducted, it looks like, in Germany. All right. And we have some results. Okay. A majority developed nausea. Okay. So if part of my uh, uh, PICO question is investigating this, this could be a good article to talk about the incidence of nausea in chemotherapy uh, because we have almost 60% of the participants developing nausea. And that's certainly a significant portion of patients to do, especially if that's interfering with their eating. And since almost a third develop vomiting, you know, this looks like the kind of thing that you'd expect would be associated with it. And so we should be on the lookout for it and looking to treat it. So this could be a great candidate for an article uh, showing that this is something that we should be concerned with, especially in this particular one, ovarian cancer treatment. Okay, great. So it looks relevant. They even have, they're talking about uh, whether they had to discontinue chemotherapy. Well, we've got some pretty high P values here. It looks like the nausea lasted a bit after the chemotherapy started. Um, yeah, that's definitely a major issue to be concerned with. Okay. All right. So remember, we need to get the reference. So we go to site and we scroll on down to APA and we check the formatting. All right. We've got the authors listed out. We've got the date. We've got the title. 
and the journal name, the volume issue number, page range, the DOI. Okay, this is an almost perfect APA style entry. I say almost perfect because in APA style, the first letter of the first word of the subtitle, in this case, the R in results, the first letter, the first word of the subtitle should be capitalized in APA style. Other than that, we can copy this into our APA course paper template and we'll be set to go. Awesome. That's going to save us a lot of time. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and grab a copy of the APA course paper template. You can grab one of these from the Writing Center website. And uh, give me just a moment to get that sharing up. Oh, uh, what are those things about a um, annotated bibliography? Is that most of the time you are going to be uh, only using only discussing the sources that you have annotations for. So if there are no other sources that you are citing, then you don't need a separate references entry. This is a particular thing for the annotated bibliography genre, where we don't need a separate reference section unless you're actually introducing and discussing them. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, check out that course paper template. All right, I have here a blank copy that I've just put in my heading here, and we need a PICO question. All right, so let's say my PICO question is Does, uh, does using uh, weekly acupuncture diminish, uh, so does we, do using weekly acupuncture significantly decrease nausea symptoms in chemotherapy patients? as measured over a, let's say, three month time period. All right, so we've got our basic elements. We've identified our population, that's chemotherapy using patients. We have our intervention that we're checking, that that is going to be using weekly acupuncture. So uh, there's probably going to be a control group, but we should specify that. So let's put that in as compared to a control group and measured over that. Okay. All right. Our control, that's the control group there. That's a C. A, our, our outcome, we're hoping that it will decrease nausea symptoms. All right. So let's introduce this. Uh, Now you can add a little bit to expand this, but you get the idea. You're saying, okay, you're writing an annotated bibliography. Here's why you're trying to answer this. All right, and now let's go into those annotations. So our first annotation here, well, we were looking at that uh, article and from reading the, the title, I see, okay, there's a meta-analysis. All right, so that's a genre. And this is going to be my first meta-analysis article. Or depends on what I'm using it for. If this could be our, our uh, prevalence of nausea, 
then that could be the a heading here. Uh, often in the annotated bibliography, we'll have some introductory literature to show, okay, this is an issue. There's documentation that this is an issue going on. And then we go into the things here. So if that's that, and I have more than one, then I can just call them prevalence of nausea and chemotherapy patients number one, number two. You'll notice I'm putting on the APA one style, the APA level one style, because these are the first headings, the, the highest levels in this piece. All right, so what do we do next? Well, we need the reference here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to the search here. And I want that reference here that I brought up by clicking on the site button. And I scroll down to APA 7th edition, select that, and back to the Word document. And I'm just going to go ahead and paste that. You see it comes with all that highlighting and stuff. I don't want that. So I mouse over to this Paste Options button, and I select Keep Text Only. All right, so we need to put in the italics, but it's mostly there. Now to save time here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a style here. Because if I add the APA reference style, you see, oh, it's now bumped in with that hanging indent there. All right, so go ahead and select the journal title, the volume number. There we go. It's formatted in APA style. Now, because this assignment says include the permalink, all right, I'm going to include a permalink. You wouldn't normally have to do this, but the instructions say include one, so great. That's 12.5% of the Grade, I am absolutely going to make sure I get that. So back to my search here, and you see that there's this permalink button. I click on that, pops this up, select that, and back to my Word document. All right, and I'm going to paste that. And there we go. All right, now. I can start my annotation. Now, just to um, make sure I've got everything in here, I am going to include, uh, you could include reference there, but we understood it's an annotated bibliography, so we're going to skip that. However, permalink, we're going to give that a heading. That'll be APA level two, because this one is level one, and the subheading of that is level two. And then we're going to have summary, and uh, as the instructions say to do here, we need to include the application. So we'll have an application section as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and apply the AP Level 2 heading to each of those. And because I know I'm going to need these for all of them, I might as well just add them now. All right, so that'll be AP level two, that'll be AP level two, that'll be AP level two. So I know that they're each going to require that, so I can just go ahead and copy and paste this to each of them. And that way I have a built-in check to go ahead and add those sections. Great. All right, summary. So again, this is going to be around uh, a page worth, uh, 200 to 250 words of summary. So I won't be able to get nearly all the article because it's six pages long, but the, the things most important here, which in my case is talking about the prevalence and you know how they were able to find this. Now, if you're listening closely, you might recall that there's one thing that I forgot to do. Remember when I said that the first letter of a subtitle, the first word needs to be capitalized? Well, when I copy and paste it, I didn't do that. 
So make sure that you go ahead and check after you paste it to do any changes that uh, you notice need to be done. All right, so my summary goes here, my application goes here, and then I move on to the next one. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to arbitrarily say that I'm going to take the next article that came in my search results as well. Now you'd want to read the, um, go ahead and read the abstract to determine this, but it doesn't take that long and you can go ahead and do this for several things in a bunch. So I've got another article I want to add here. I find it. This happens to be a systematic review. All right. Well, I've got my meta-analysis stuff here. I can just go ahead and uh, select these placeholders here. And go ahead and paste them here and just change that to systematic review one. And systematic review two. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the process you saw before, uh, but I'm going to keep the Word document shared here. So when I am in the browser, I'm going to go to the site button and I'm going to go ahead and grab the APA reference, paste that. Okay, I got some extra formatting, so I'll go ahead, keep text only, add the APA reference style. Now got the journal italicis, and oh, I've got the name in Spanish and the name in English. Now, uh, you'd want to look this up, but this seems to be a journal that is in uh, Spanish and so the title is translated to English. So what you do here is you move the title translation here and you just translate it in English, no italics there in square brackets. We've got the volume number that's 158. And oh, the title of the journal article itself, that should be in sentence case here. So to save time rather than manually change all that, I can select it and take this button here and select lowercase. There, and it's done that fast. All right. And I need my permalink. I'm reminded that I need that because there is a, <laughs> a space there. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go and use the permalink button in the catalog. Grab that. Okay, we've got a permalink. And now we are ready to do the summary and the application. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the last part of this. And remember, looking at the rubric here, one point comes from, okay, you, you've written an annotated bibliography, you've got the right number of articles. Another one of the eight points comes from just having those permalinks. Okay, those are pretty easy to get. The summary, people I usually don't have too much trouble with that. But what's this next part? Ah, to write about the article's application to your PICO question in your own words. So how does this relate to what you're doing? So let's focus on that. So this is essentially asking you to answer the question, well, why did, or how does this matter for what you're trying to do? How does this connect or inform your work on this topic, and you're trying to answer your question. And one of the places that people often run astray here is that they start doing more summarizing the article rather than connecting it or rather than clearly connecting it to your topic. And a great way to make those connections is to use phrases that show synthesis, like this suggests or therefore X or based on this, we should do X, or based on this as uh, suggestion to follow up, uh, there is support for doing it this way, where this provides a model for X. Okay, so let's go ahead and in our last couple minutes, let's go and talk about how some of that synthesis might come into play with our first article here about uh, prevalence of nausea in chemotherapy patients.
So we're not going to bother with the summary thing. People usually have uh, no trouble writing a summary there. If anything, it's trouble cutting it down to the maximum length here. But the application here, so how can we talk about it? Well, you could say this article, or we can refer to it by using the first author at all, because in APA 7, we immediately abbreviate any article citation if there are three or more authors. Whoopin at all 2020, a extensively documented the prevalence of chemotherapy. Sorry, uh, the prevalence of nausea in chemotherapy patients. This shows that this is an important issue for healthcare practitioners. So we have this text here that shows that, which is our introductory phrase that tells us that there's synthesis going on. Now, depending on what the evidence is and how strong it is and how many participants and all that stuff, you may use different language. You might say, okay, well, rather than this shows or this demonstrates, if it's more preliminary, you might say this suggests or if it's something that was on a particular context and you're not sure if the, it'll be fully generalizable, you might use this wording again. You know, it's how strong a claim are you making? Well, okay. The prevalence of nausea suggests that this would be, uh, that a successful measure for decreasing nausea would be worth modest associated cost. Okay. So we've got a tie in to our PICO question here, which is again, does using weekly acupuncture significantly decreased nausea symptoms. All right, so we've made a claim here. So let's back it up with evidence. For example, a study found that almost two thirds of patients receiving ovarian cancer, uh, sorry, re receiving chemotherapy for ovarian cancer experienced severe nausea. According to, and then you can cite guidelines uh, if they're relevant. Uh, if, the, if you're citing an out, outside source, it's not in one of these annotations. That's why you would have a separate reference section in an annotated bibliography. It's usually unnecessary, but if I was going to align this with the um, DNP essentials, then I could certainly do that. But you get the idea. We are, are presenting different pieces of information and then connecting them to the topic. Based on this study or based on what was found in the study, this looks like something that is worth investigating. And then if, uh, for example, uh, this systematic review turned out to be one about acupuncture specifically, then I would talk about how, okay, so in general, acupuncture has been found to decrease XYZ, in this case, probably nausea. And then, although it hasn't been applied to the specific thing, well, the, these results suggest that this would be worth looking into. And it's not just going to be, you know, it's worth it, worthy of investigation, but also it's the specifics, like has a particular healthcare model been used? Has this been used across diverse populations? These are the kinds of details that you would relay and that you would use and contextualize. Well, based on this, maybe this systematic review found a different result 
but you look at it and say, well, this is not the same as the T in, sorry, as the P in my population. They were looking at this group. However, this group has a genetic tendency. I'll give an example. Redheads tend to have a different pain threshold than the general population. So, and they tend to be less responsive to anesthesia. So this can significantly affect uh, to what you're giving them for before a procedure, and also can affect their quality of life if their painkillers are not calibrated. So you might be saying, well, based on this thing, uh, this finding here, well, they were doing this in Ireland at the World Redhead Gathering. This, these results may not be indicative of the general population. And, and so some of what you may be writing in your application is talking about findings that are not relevant or that you are discounting or saying might be discountable because of other considerations that you've noticed. Uh, a great example is if you are looking at medical textbooks from a certain period and they're talking about the, uh, shall we say, uncomfort or discomfort associated with menses with your having a monthly period. And you'll find that there are lots of 19th century medical textbooks that say, oh, no, this is perfectly harmless. Uh, it should not cause any trouble at all. And then you, you look at the person who wrote it and you wonder, OK, did they actually ask any women here or how large was their sample size? And so th there may be factors like that where you say, well, OK, but this study about smoking cessation was paid for by Philip Morris, the tobacco company. There seems to be a pretty clear conflict of interest here. Whatever it is, if it's something that you think is relevant that will affect how these key details you have in your summary might be applied to your finding, that's something to bring up in your application section. This concludes our webinar for today. I hope that this has been helpful. If you joined us late and you would like a copy of the recording, we always post the recordings for our webinars generally the same evening that the webinar is offered. And if you are RSVP to our, our webinar, we will automatically send you a copy of the recording and a slide deck. And if you didn't RSVP, but you are attending anyway, and you'd like that, just type your email address in the chat window and we'll be happy to send that to you. Have a good evening, everyone.